My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Well, we are talking about the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15, and we are doing so looking at it through the prism of the new creation. As I have shared with you, no, virtually no one doubts that the resurrection brings in the new heaven and the new earth, brings in the new Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 20, the resurrection, chapter 21, new creation. And on and on it goes. You know, we, we find that connection everywhere. So I've been sharing with you, based upon Isaiah chapter 65, so, some thoughts in regard to the new creation. Now, Isaiah 65 is, is the fountain from which the New Testament doctrine of the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, flows. Virtually all commentators agree with that. What's interesting is they start seeing the problems for their traditional views when they take Isaiah for what it says and so all of a sudden they start saying, oh, well, there's no doubt that Peter was drawing on Isaiah chapter 65, but Peter and John both, John and Revelation, changed up what Isaiah said. Well, that's interesting. And it's really sad. Well, we've looked at the new heaven and new earth, and boy, did you hear that. We've got some real thunder and lightning taking place uh, here in Ardmore this morning. Anyway... I've been looking at, at the, in our last video on this subject, we looked at the new Jerusalem in light of Hebrews chapter 12. Well, I left that hanging just a little bit. I think it's absolutely essential to look at Hebrews 11 and 12 in light of the doctrine of the new Jerusalem and also the new heaven and the new earth in light of the Abrahamic promise. And then, in light of what the writer of Hebrews says, what did Abraham look for? Now look, we spent an entire series on the Abrahamic promise of the resurrection. Okay? What does Hebrews 11 teach us about Abraham's eschatological hope? Well, let's take a look at this. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10, uh, in verse 9 and 10, Abraham, along with Isaac and Jacob, dwelt in tents as foreigners in a strange land. Why? For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So Abraham, uh, look folks, Abraham wasn't looking for dirt. He wasn't looking for an inheritance of physical dirt as his ultimate goal. All right? And his ultimate hope, his eschatological hope. Okay? But he looked for a city. Now watch this. In verse 14, let's look at verse 13. These all died, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, died in faith, not having received the promises. Well, what were they, what's the promise they were looking for? A city whose builder and maker is God. But having seen them, watch this now, Far off, you know, we're told that time statements don't mean a single thing. Uh, you know, uh, God was so incapable of conveying and communicating truthfully about time that n no time statement means anything. Really, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saw the promise of the city whose builder and maker is God far off. Far off. Was well, about 1900 years. I think that qualifies as far off. You see, God did communicate truthfully to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob about time. It is absolutely nonsensical for people to argue that God doesn't tell time, that God is so transcendent over time that he doesn't understand time. No, God can tell time. God has always communicated truthfully about time. Well, okay. Having seen those promises afar off, they were assured of them. They embraced them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. And yet we are told that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were looking for an inheritance on the earth. No, they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now watch this. 
for those who say such things, what things? That they're strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, a patrida, a fatherland. Now watch this. And truly, if they had been called, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Hey, look, if Abraham was going to inherit the physical earth, why did he ever have to leave Hebron? I mean, after all, he's going to inherit it. Why not stay there? Anyway, but now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. I wonder if that's the new heaven and new earth. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. What kind of a city? Well, it's a heavenly country. If it's a heavenly country, then guess what? It's a heavenly city. It's a city whose builder and maker is God. Oh, but wait. Verse 35. What are they looking for? Heavenly country, heavenly city, verse 35, resurrection. In that new heaven, new earth, in that heavenly city. Now, you just have to catch the, the power of this. What did we see in our last video on the new Jerusalem? You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Well, you know, that word heavenly is the same word back here they're looking for a heavenly country, heavenly city. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. Now look, Abraham saw that far off. But the writer of Hebrews said that he and his audience had come to it. And yet we're supposed to believe that it still hasn't arrived, even though it's been longer, longer from the days of Jesus to the present than it was from Abraham until Jesus. But Abraham saw it far off. They had come to it. And we're supposed to be still waiting for it? No, makes no sense whatsoever. Now look, folks, if they had come to the New Jerusalem and they were waiting for it about to come, Hebrews 13, 14, then that means that that better resurrection, they had arrived at the time for the resurrection because the resurrection would be in Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. Yeah, we've got more, so we'll see you on the flip side.